Good morning, church. Um, it's quite a sentiment that Jesus has overcome the world. You know, when I think of that and, and think of just what we are going to share today, I think of how amazing that is that, that we live because of him, because of his mercy. And he has truly overcome the world, no matter the problems we're going through. Today, we're going to be talking about connecting hearts. Connecting hearts, you know, and you, you see the hearts down there, they're, they're kind of there. And you think to yourself, Pastor John, this isn't Valentine's Day. Why are we talking about connecting hearts? Why is this a, a, something about love and everything? But the thing is, is that love is a topic that fascinates us. It's, it's all through our society. It's in every, every society, every culture, even those cultures that do not have a word for love. And, and there are some languages, some, some, you know, because the world has thousands and thousands of languages, there are some languages that don't even have a word for it but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist because love is something that is hardwired into us is something that uh is is just constant through our society books that we produce movies our songs celebrated if you go on amazon and and you do kindle books like the ebooks right there the thing is that the biggest category is romance. Uh, our movies, you know, even action movies usually have a love interest of some sort in it. And songs, I mean, if you look at all the hit songs, there are a few that don't have love, but a lot of them do. Most of them do. It's, it's something that just practically consumes us. We obsess over it and often to unhealthy extremes, but we obsess over it because like I said earlier, we're, we're hardwired to, to love. It's as much a part of our lives really as breathing is. We can't not be connected somehow to love. That doesn't mean we always love, but we always have a, a deep desire for it. Uh, hole in our hearts that needs that love. But do we truly understand love's power and purpose? I mean, we get glimpses, of course, and we have, you know, we even have movies or whatever that show love, the power of love, that kind of thing. But do we really understand it? Do we really understand his power? And do we really understand his purpose? Well, that's kind of what we're going to go through today, but before we get there, let's pray. Father, I just thank you, first and foremost, that you love us, that you loved us enough to send Jesus Christ for us to die on the cross for us, that you love us in an unfathomable way. And Lord, as we come together now to really learn more about you and to see, see just how love figures into that overall factor of your plan for us. I just ask, Lord, that you'd open your scripture, open your word, open our hearts and minds, Lord, to receive your truth. Get my words out of the way and just help it all be your words, Lord. May you be the speaker, you be the teacher. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to, to inform us on a deep, deep level. Help us, Lord, to understand just who you are and what you have for us. In Christ's name, amen. You know, the most familiar verse in the Bible is, un, is about love, and almost anybody out there probably quote it for us john three sixteen says for god so loved the world that he gave his only and one and one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life i stumbled there because like a lot of us i memorized a different version of that same verse but the thought is still the same in the niv that god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son 
he didn't love just one person. He didn't love just, you know, Joe or Susie or Sally or Yang Yang. He loved the world. And that level of love is staggering to us. It's something that is really hard for us to comprehend. Uh, a level of love that is for everyone. You know, the good and the bad, the pretty and the ugly, the the smart and the dumb, you know, whoever. He, he loves us all. There's a an old illustration of a bridge operator. Now, you've seen those bridges maybe. Uh, maybe you've driven across some of them that, that will open, right? That they'll be closed at one point so traffic can go through, but they, they cross over a river. And as you're going along the river, you know, sometimes there will be a large boat, a ship or something like that on these big, these big rivers. And, you know, the bridge is too low. And so what the engineers have designed is these bridges that will go up like this. And traffic will stop on either sh side of the shore while the bridge is up. Well, there's an old story about a bridge operator that, um, you know, his job was to watch for whenever the ships would come. And then he would raise the, the bridge up so that they could get through. Well, he had a little boy and his little boy just loved to come with him. So the, the little boy loved to, to look at the mechanisms and just be with his dad and, uh, and of course, the, the father loved the, his son, you know, and they, they would play together. But, you know, the father would always be very careful to watch for the, the ships that might be coming. Well, one day, as, or actually one evening, uh, he's out there looking and he sees a light coming in the distance. And it's a, a party boat. It's this, this big big party boat that's coming along but it's just too tall and so he's going to have to raise the bridge and so he looks around for his son and he realizes his son who was normally playing right there is not there anymore his son has actually wandered off and gone down into the mechanism of the bridge now he calls for his son he says come back come back you know but his, his son is down there where they can't he can't really hear him and the boat is getting closer and closer and closer and it's to the point now that he can see the individuals on there and, and they're just you know they're not paying attention they're having a good time they're having, you know they're completely oblivious to the drama that's going on inside the bridge works and the father realizes that if he doesn't raise the bridge this entire boat is just going to collapse all of these people are going to die but if he raises the bridge where his son is the mechanism will kill his son. And so he's got a decision to make. Is he going to open the bridge so that these people can survive? People who don't even know what's going on. Or is he going to instead leave it down so they can die and save his son? <coughs> and he makes the choice with tears running down his face to open the bridge killing his son, and letting the boat go through. Now, that's an analogy, and not a, not a great analogy, because of the standpoint that Jesus obviously knew what he was doing. But in this case, in this analogy, just like it is in real life, when God sent his own son to die on the cross, he did it for people who might never know about it. Those people on that boat, you know, they didn't, they might have read, some of them might have read in the newspaper what happened later, but they would never know what really happened. Even more amazing is God did this for people who hate him. God sent his son to die on a cross for people who reject him, who despise him, who use his name as a, as a curse word. And he still send his only begotten son to die on a cross to suffer that for those people. And when we bring it down even further, he also sacrificed his son for us. Yeah, you might think, well, I'm not such a bad person. But when you really think about it, when you think of how many times you've hurt people, 
intentionally, not just unintentionally. When you think of the things that you have done that you would be ashamed for God, a holy God to see, and yet you still did them. When you think of the thoughts that somehow times go through your heads that you don't want anybody to know, but they're definitely there. When you think of those secret times when you do things that are really, really not of God. When you think of that and you realize that even though you do those things and even though God knows you do those things and will do those things, he still sacrificed his son for you and for me. That level of love is staggering. And this is the thing. His son, Jesus, unlike that little boy in the illustration, his son, Jesus, agreed to it. Jesus went to the cross willingly, knowing he was going to suffer, knowing the abuse he was going to receive, knowing the agony. And not only that, knowing that he was going to, in that moment of death, he was going to be taking on all of our sins, all of the grime, the dirt, the disgusting things. He was going to take that all on himself. And he agreed to it. You have to ask, why would anyone do this? Why would, why would anyone even think of doing this? Romans 5, 7 through 8, though, gives us this. It says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This type of love seems inexplicable. But it shows us just how powerful true love can be. So where does such a love like this, where does it come from? Well, 1 John 4, 7 through 9 tells us, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Did you pick up a couple of things here? Love comes from God. We know that all good things that they exist come from God. And love is a great thing. And love comes from God. Not only that, John makes the analogy because we know that God is righteous and God is omniscient and omnipresent and all those things. But he also gives another trait about God. He says, God is love. In other words, God is so much. He's not some nebulous feeling. Don't get me wrong. But God is so much identified with love that John would even say that God is love. His very nature is love. Now, in context, John is speaking directly to Christians. He's talking about the fact that if Christians are not showing this love, if this love doesn't exist in them, then, you know, it's really difficult to say that how could they be born of God. But yet we know that even non-Christians know how to love. So, so what's going on here? Well, John's talking about a different kind of love. He's talking about a love that is surpassing normal love is a christ-like love but we need to step back up a little bit and once again look at this that yet even non-christians know how to love now why is that how can a non-christian really understand that it's because all of humanity is created in god's image men and women we were created in his image and since god is a being of love, then we also are very much uh, recipients of that image, recipients of being able 
to love. We can, we can no longer escape wanting to be loved or having the desire to love, then we can stop, as we talked about, breathing or eating or anything else. It's hardwired into us. It's part of us. However, a relationship with Christ opens up the door to love wider. We have a, a great capacity to love, but it is nothing compared to the love of God, the love of Christ. And that is what happens as we, as we trust in God, as we, as we turn our lives over to him. He opens up a door so that we can love in ways that normally we wouldn't be able to love. And why is that? It's because believers, not only are we in the image of God, believers are also being conformed to Christ's image. We are being transformed literally from the inside out by the Holy Spirit. As we turn our lives over to God, as we draw closer and closer to him, he changes us. He begins to conform us into the image of his son who showed this incredible sacrificial love. And as we get more and more like Christ, then we get more and more to the point where we too can begin to show this incredible love toward others. Christ even commanded his followers to love. In John 13, 34 through 35, he tells them, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so much so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I like that. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. See, for the Christian, love is like a spiritual ID. Many of us have driver's licenses. Um, some people from their, their home countries have ID cards, etc. You know, that, that identifies you. For a Christian, though, our love is like a spiritual ID. Jesus says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. In other words, they'll be able to tell if you love one another. Because you're loving one another in a way that is the world just does not necessarily see. Our spiritual ID, this love, it identifies us to others. It tells people, hey, there's something different. These, these people, these Christians, they don't act like other people would in certain situations. They love even when it, it doesn't seem normal. That's because we are being conformed to the image of Christ. And Christ loved the world. Unfortunately, too many of us, even though we're Christians, too many of us seem to be working undercover. We have our IDs, right? But we hide it in our pockets. We don't flash it. You know, they, we, we're working undercover. You see, unfortunately, love is the last thing the world sees from many of us. Many of us have accepted Jesus. We've accepted that love. We've accepted that he's not only died for us, we've accepted that free gift, but we have made him Lord of our lives. But Oftentimes we slip on that and we move back undercover and that love, which should be our identify, identification, it should be the badge that we wear. It's the last thing the world sees from us. And they come into our churches or they hang around us and they don't see any difference. And they think, well, why do I need to be here? What, what is, what is this got for me? because they don't see that love. They don't see the thing that would be the most attractive thing about Christianity. See, it's the thing the world needs to see most in us. They need to see our love for others. They need to see our love that is inexplicable because as they see our love in our actions, in our words, in our attitudes, they see something that they desperately need. Because when they see our love, they begin to see Christ. 
Christ is not physically walking with us like he did in the days of the early disciples. No, he's passed the torch to us. We are to be his living representatives. We are to be his ambassadors. We are to be the people that show the world Christ. Too many times they don't see that. Oh, they see people getting together. They see people in a church building. They see people that will say the right words, but they don't see the attitude. They don't really see the action. They don't really see the love. So how do we climb back up from where we've fallen? If we are, if we are supposed to be Christians that are identified by love, and we're not doing it anymore. We've obviously slipped some from where we said it should be. So how do we climb back up from where we've fallen? If you would think about it almost like this, it's almost like we've fallen into a pit that I'm calling the pit of false connection. We've fallen into a state in our churches and in our relationships where we smile, the right kind of smile. We, we, we say the right words. We may even give a gift or two. We may even engage in some form of service. And yet, there's a shallowness. There's a, a, a lost sense of connection. It's like when you're, when you're on a cell phone, you know, you've been talking to somebody and it, it breaks up and, you know, you're saying, can you hear me now? I mean, it's, it's like between two or three people. We're supposed to see that love. We're supposed to be feeling that love. But instead, there's this emptiness. Have you, do you know what I mean? Have you felt that in, in times when you're around others? Have you felt that emptiness? Have you felt that disconnect? Have you felt like, you know, you're, you're somehow not a part of it and that maybe nobody else is a part of it. That's the pit of false connection. That's where we have fallen oftentimes as a church and as a, as a body of Christ, we've fallen into this pit of false connection where we're going through the motions, but the love, the true love is not there. But Jesus gives us the answer of how to get that back how that we can work on giving, getting to the point where once again we are truly living to the nature that we're supposed to be having as Christians. When asked about in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, when asked about what the two greatest commandments in the Bible were, or what the greatest commandment in the Bible were, was, and then Jesus just gave another that went along with it, Jesus says this. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God, not sort of, not okay, not when I feel like it, but love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In here are three key concepts that help restore us. That if we really practice them, they help us re restore us to that point where we too can be once again loving. The first is connecting our hearts to his. We need to learn to look up not down or around. We need to look up to God. First and foremost, the greatest commandment. We need to be loving the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul, with all our mind. That requires us to be looking up, as I said, not, not down, not down at our circumstances or, or, or how far we've fallen, not around at, at the other people or the other attractions of the world, but instead really connecting our hearts to his by seeking him first. You see, the lure of the pit is this. 
it's easy. Yeah, shallow. Yeah, you know, it's, it's not all that we want. But it's easy. We don't have to expend a lot of effort. We don't have to truly love. We can just exist and, and sort of, you know, get what we can and it can be nice. It can be look pretty. People smile at us. But it has nothing there. But yet, because it's easy, because we, we don't have to work at it, because we really don't have to turn our life completely over to God, then we tend to be okay with the pit. It's a nice fat bait for us. And we've fallen hook, line, and sinker. But to get out of that pit, to be truly alive in God, to be truly fulfilling your purpose, to be truly learning to love, we need to look up and grab hold of his lifeline, grab hold of him. We need to be drawing near to him. In other words, we need to be working in this as well. We don't just grab a hold. We actually have to really desire to get closer. Our, our hearts, our, our, our actions need to be working toward trying to connect to him, to get closer to him. Then we need to let him lift us up and out because quite frankly, we cannot do it in our own strength. James 4, 7 through 10 tells us, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and enjoy the gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And if we look at this from the pit analogy, we're, we're, we're in that pit, you know, and the devil's there too. And all those temptations and all that, that shallowness. But he's saying, no. James is telling us through, inspired by God, he says, no, resist that. Resist this devil. Flee, he will flee from you. Then come near to God. Grab that lifeline. and He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, put that stuff behind you. Repent of that. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. In other words, reject all of these other things that, this shallowness and instead humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. He will get you out of that pit. It is only when we reject the empty pleasures of the pit that we can learn to love God as we should. Only when we turn our backs on the shallowness, only when we decide this is not working, this is not who I was called to be then we can learn to love God as we should. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 tells us, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anything love, anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, notice how he puts these things. The things that we are loving, they're not that great. It's the lust of the flesh. It's the lust of the eyes. It's the, the pride of life. These are, these are things that, if we really think of them, are pretty negative. And yet we have somehow, because in our, in our shallowness, we have somehow made ourselves believe they're okay because they give us some kind of pleasure. But what God is saying is we need to reject this. We need to reject this because these things are just going to pass away. But those who follow God, yeah, they're going to live forever. So you ask, well, must we reject the world completely then? You know, maybe go out into some kind of 
become a monk, be in some kind of hermitage where we don't have anything around us. We're just completely focused, you know, praying 24 seven, that kind of thing. No, God gave us so many things to enjoy things that can remind us of who God is. You can walk in nature. You can look at flowers. You can look at the, the, the trees and the animals. You can look at the sun, the clouds in the sky, and you can see the grandeur of God. In a child's, in a child's smile, you can see God. You can see this in so many different things. It's talking about those other things, those things that distract us those things that are false pleasures that appeal to us in a very shallow sense, but are not truly drawing us closer, not helping us to recognize who God is and what all he has done for us. We must reject the things not of God because they come between him and us. Anything that we put between us and God is an idol. Whether it's our love for food, whether it's our love for just hanging out with our friends, whether it's a love for, you know, work. I mean, some of us are workaholics, right? If, if, whatever it is. If these things are not of God, they're coming between us. And our relationship that relationship between God and us must be pure. It must always be strong. As we focus not on the lusts of the world, but instead on who he is and what he has done for, him, for us, we can't help but love him wholeheartedly. If we really turn our minds, our entire attention to the fact of what God has done for us, how much he loves us, what he has done, how he provides for us, how he cares for us on a daily basis. We can't help but love him wholeheartedly. The second key is opening that connection to others. You know, we live in a, a connected world as far as the internet goes. It's everywhere. And Oftentimes you can, um, you can go over to somebody's house and you might want to connect to their Wi-Fi or whatever. You might want to be looking up something. And then you have to ask that person to open that connection so that you can actually use their Wi-Fi and so that you can connect to the internet from there. If you can think of that idea of connecting, that in some ways is what when we begin to love other people, we're doing. We are opening that connection between the love of God that is flowing through us to them. We can love. We have the capacity as humans to love other people. But once again, what is really attractive is when it's the love of God flowing through us. A love that is beyond just human love. A love that is an incredible, an incredible love that stems only from God. You see, there are others in the pit with us. There are other people all around us in this pit, living in lonely, shallow lives as well, who desperately need that connection. And sometimes it just needs one person, one person who has opened up to God, who is truly living for God, who is truly loving like God loves. For the people in the pit to look around and see, hey, yeah, there is a better way. People flocked to the early church because they saw them in relationship with each other, in love with God, and in love with each other, meeting each other's needs, etc. They flocked to the early church because they saw something there that was incredible. They, caught, they saw the love of God in action. And when people see that in our lives, then the other people in the pit with us, yeah, be surprised if they don't flock right to that. Because loving others as ourselves is a powerful witness. There was 
right before 9-11, in the days before that, there was a refugee uh, center in Pakistan, a refugee camp for people who were fleeing uh, the Taliban, et cetera, in Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, these families, they, it was, it was terrible. There was a lot, it's refugee camps often are, there's lots of disease, et cetera. And there was this missionary couple that was working in that camp and uh, they, um, they would do things like they would um, give the, the kids like blankets, uh, like a quilt, a shawl, and they would bathe their wounds. And, and you know, all, often these kids, they had sores and there was pu open pus and pink eye and their shoes were, their feet were a mess because they had no shoes. And what they decided to do, the only real way that they could love these kids and these other people there was just to minister to them physically. They couldn't share openly they could still love them in a very Christ-like way. And so what they began to do is they began to gather the children and they began to wash their feet. They washed the children's feet. They cleaned them off. They gave them, uh, they gave them little sandals to wear and things like that. And they um, silently prayed for them, silently prayed for them. Well, one of these little girls uh, went to their, they, they had a, a refugee teacher there. And this, this refugee teacher was asked the, the class that she had of these children a question. And she said, um, what is, um, uh, who is the greatest Muslim? Who are the greatest Muslims? And the little girl raised her hand. She said, the Kafirs. Now a Kafir, in Arabic is basically, and it means unbeliever. And they use it for Christians oftentimes. And so that, it, it, it took the, the teacher by complete shock and surprise. I mean, she's like, once she recovered, she was like, well, what do you mean? And this little girl said, well, the Muslim fighters killed my father, but the Kafirs washed my feet. See, even this little child saw something different. This little child saw love being expressed, even in something as, as small as washing someone's feet. The child saw love that attracted. Loving others as ourselves is a powerful, powerful witness. Loving others as ourselves also works as a sin repellent. Because it, just like mosquito spray or something like that, you know, when we spend so much time loving others as ourselves, then we are not likely to do the sins against others because instead we're loving others. Romans 13, 8 through 10 tells us this. It says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others to fulfill the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. If we are truly loving others, we won't be doing these things that we are commanded not to do. Because all of those things, if you look at the commandments, they revolve in around two core concepts. Loving God, not putting anything before him, and treating others the way you would want to be treated yourself. Loving others the way you love yourself. That right there is, is really the whole heart of everything. And that brings us to our, our last key. Connecting hearts helps his purpose. See, God seeks a restored fellowship with mankind. And the law and the prophets that, we, that you see, all of that scripture of do not do this, thou shalt not whatever, 
all of those basically they're pointing the way of how we should live but love love comes in and fulfills all of that our love for him and others makes us partners in his plan as we love him completely wholeheartedly with heart soul and mind and we allow that love of him to overflow in our love for others then we become partners in this this whole kingdom purpose partners in his plan for mankind to to bring us together into this restored fellowship but this all boils down to one big question are we committed to truly loving are we committed to truly loving See, life is easy in the shallows until the waves come. The pit of false connections, you know, it's never going to be able to satisfy us. Only, only God, only loving him completely and letting him love others through us, only that can truly satisfy us. Only through loving God and others can we discover true meaning, true purpose in our lives. Because we were made to love. Don't you want more than mere existence? Don't you want something deeper than what you've got? The only way to get there is to turn yourself over completely to God to truly seek after him, to truly desire to love him completely and wholeheartedly. And then that, let, that, that love flow through you to other people. Our challenge is, may working on our heart connection become our passion. We often say we're passionate about a lot of things, but may this be our passion our heart connection to God and others. May that become our passion in life. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for, for love. Thank you that it is, is such a part of our lives. But Lord, we want to experience it more deeply. We want to experience in the way it was truly designed to be experienced. You gave us the capacity to love. So many times how we love is, is polluted by other things. And so it becomes weak and self-centered and never really reaching out in the way it should. But God, through Christ, you've opened those doors wide. So let us just embrace you, Lord. Help us to love as you love. Help us to love you first and foremost beyond anything else, keeping our eyes firmly fixed on you. And then, Lord, help us to truly love others as you would have us love others. Help us to be a part of this great kingdom building. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, now we come to our time of tithes and offering. And as usual, there's various ways to give. Zella, uh, bank. just set this up with your bank account and the easiest way possible. Venmo, uh, if you choose this method, I, like I said, I personally never done it, but it is also a really good, I know some people use it, and that's a good way to give. Or, of course, you can just mail your check in. Either way, um, our ministry, the ministries of so many different things, you know, we, we belong to God, and he takes care of us. But he oftentimes, he directs people to give. And so we just ask for you to be open to that and to give back to God in the way that he has given to you. And may the Lord who 
loved us so much. Help us to truly reflect that love to others and to draw us closer to him. Amen.